Well, clearly, I think the highlights are, are about the um, the outcome trials for the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 agonists. Um, it must be, I think, understood that the diabetes field has been, you know, has been running dry in terms of um, outcome trials that were positive in the sense that you, that actually they actually that some drug or some maneuver actually improves um, patient outcomes until last year when we had the EMPAREC and we had the LEADER trial and there's this year uh, here also the, um, what's it called, the SUSTAIN trial which is on another uh, GLP-1 agonist. So we are seeing here that two drug classes apparently can improve prognosis. That's, that's new. Um, I also think that we are struggling to understand why this is so. There are lots of symposia and uh, talks and papers and posters on people speculating why this might be so. This is another way of saying that many people do not actually think that it is glucose related. So what then is it? Um, and are they the same or probably separate? So what is it about these drugs? particular drugs or is it a class effect all these questions nevertheless we have something very positive uh, to talk about I'm a clinician so um, to have more tools to improve patient prognosis is clearly at the end of the day that's the key thing and so uh, last year but also this year we are in a very happy phase that we can actually talk about that kind of drugs it's also interesting to compare that to the experience with DPP-4 inhibitors which by and large do not appear to improve prognosis according to the trials. Although in very large databases they actually come out on top um, compared to let's say um, SU, uh, SU derivatives. And that's important because the discrepancy be between these two, between these let's say relatively short two to three year trials on one hand and these very large databases which can almost mimic a trial and are basically real-life experience suggests that they actually do improve prognosis. And this discrepancy, and also the discrepancy between DPP-4 inhibitor experience and GLP-1 agonist uh, and SGLT2 inhibitors on the other hand, that's I think um, um, a key issue in diabetology and diabetic medicine at this moment. And you know, this, this whole meeting is full of it. Certainly, I I am an academic clinician, so many of the things, many of the things that you know that are presented here are things that I've already been brought, um, be, be, been aware of through other channels. But you know, many practicing clinicians will not be, and so for them it is extremely important that meetings such as these, which have the presenters, but also through the poster sessions where you can actually interact with people doing the research, I think it's a key thing. And it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that this meeting is such a success in terms of, uh, just even in terms of numbers. I think medical students should attend. Um, at, a, at the very least, if they have an interest in clinical medicine in this particular field, and or if they have an interest in the research that goes behind that, because they will actually see what a large congress is about, how people interact. Again, they, through the poster session, they can interact with very experienced um, uh, investigators, clinical investigators, basic scientists. They can do networking. They can see how it works. They can see whether they like it. Would they, be, would they want to be at that podium and give that talk themselves in three or four years from now, that's a very realistic question uh, at that stage in one's career. So I think yes, uh, by all means they should attend. Yes, well, I, I basically do try to sort of make a program where I look at the, I look at these outcome trials, I look at the um, the review lectures in things that I'm not very knowledgeable about, so mostly the things that are a little bit, you know, away from my own expertise. Um, clearly, the, the prize-winning lectures are usually very good reviews of their topic, as we heard this morning by Mark Cooper, so that are usually highlights for me. 
and then uh, I, of course I go to the uh, research topics that are of my particular interest where we have uh, data and where you know look at what the competition is doing so that's basically how I uh, organize the meeting yeah well it, I, I do think it depends on where one is in one's career um, if one is a practicing clinician one might select um, one might select things that will actually change your practice next week. So you can ask yourself the question, if I know this, will I change my practice in my outpatient clinic on Monday? Um, truly, these things are rare, but there are some of these. Uh, then I would go for things um, that perhaps may not affect practice, but I would want to know their possibilities or just to know what the state of the art is in that. If I do not run an exercise program for people with uh, type 2 diabetes in my own patient, outpatient clinic, um, what are people saying here that uh, an exercise program, what should it be like and so on? Uh, should I use accelerometers in my practice or should I try to do that? So that's perhaps a clinician's perspective. If you're, uh, if you're a PhD student and you're going into your basic science, then I think that one should, of course, select very heavily on the precise topic that you that one is working on and then also on these review lectures that are perhaps a little bit away from that field but are still close enough that you feel that a good review a good review lecture may change your life if you hear something and you think oh if that is so how can we take this further and if and some of these lectures are very inspiring so for young people i i recommend the review lectures because they are um they, they are state-of-the-art and they can be life-changing. Oh, um, well, our own research is on mainly on the pathogenesis of diabetic complications, but also on what one, what one might call either comorbidities or complications. Um, let's say cognitive decline, depression, it's not so clear whether that's a true complication in the same sense that nephropathy is a complication or whether it's a, let's say a comorbidity that, has, that shares origins with uh, diabetes or that it's actually both. Uh, so we, we run a fairly large program on asking those questions and um, specifically I think that uh, the, the data that we are presenting here are about, um, about vascular function in pre-diabetes where we quite consistently find that people with diabetes have impaired vascular function also of small vessels that's not new but what is new I think is that this is also present in pre-diabetes um, so apparently not only the large vessel problem starts before onset of diabetes but actually also the microvascular problem starts before diabetes onset um, we must also remember, I think, that science is technology driven. One, one researches what one can measure. So in clinical science, large vessels has been, have been the sort of topic of interest for 30 years, simply because they are superficial. We can actually measure them by ultrasound. So you have all this information about large blood vessels. But now we are entering a stage where you can do microvascular function tests with new technology and you can apply them to thousands of people so I think we are now entering an era this has never been possible up to let's say a couple of years ago we are now entering an area where we were where for large vessels 30 years ago we are now I think going to have the same sort of explosion of knowledge on small blood vessels where I think a lot of the problems of diabetes actually originate um, we are going to see that in the uh, in the near future, I think, and that's a topic that we are working very hard on. Another topic that we are working hard on is the, uh, is the role of the complement system, that is a very ancient um, system that is part of our innate defense. But interestingly, there are connections with, uh, with uh, obesity development. Some forms of complement appear to increase your chances of get, becoming obese and some impair, appear to impair beta cell function. So there, is, there are connections between the complement system and diabetes development, and that's another topic that we are having here, we are here having uh, uh, presentations on. Uh, 
I think that um, basically if one looks at technology that one can apply to thousands of people, then one is limited to, I think, the retina, the skin and the brain. Brain MRI will give you some estimate of microvascular structure um, in the brain. It's not really function, it's structure. But you can back that up with things like cognit uh, cognitive testing and um, um, depression scores or depressive symptom scores. And you can get some form of uh, function there. But in the retina, one can look both at structure, at, uh, dia at diameters of vessels, but also about re uh, at reactivity of blood vessels. Uh, for example, there is a flicker light stimulation method that one can apply. It's basically an apparatus that one can use to look at blood vessels in the retina where they are actually immediately accessible. Now, the retina is very interesting for two reasons, perhaps for three reasons. The first reason is that it is a typical diabet diabetic target organ. The second is that the, um, the, the ontogeny of blood vessels in the retina shares many similarities with brain blood vessels. So it is likely that information that you get from blood vessels in the retina are of particular interest for what happens in the brain. And the third is, is that the retinal microcirculation is very sensitive to what happens in large vessels because retinal autoregulation is relatively poor. It shares that property with the kidney and with the brain. So typically in diabetes but also in hypertension, if you have large vessel problems, then basically your small vessel problems will target itself on the retina, the brain and the kidney. Uh, and that's probably because they have relatively poor autoregulation. So systemic pressures go deep into the microcirculation of those organs. Um, so I think that the retina is probably um, both accessible and extremely informative on what happens to microcirculatory functions in people with diabetes, pre-diabetes, obesity and so on and so forth. Well, I think that, you know, these, these metabolic drugs that we are now seeing are significant advantage, uh, advances. It's also, inter also interesting that at least the, the outcome of the EMPAREC trial was a surprise to most people. People had not really expected that and they're now sort of struggling to find an explanation for it. And it will be good to see that a similar trial, perhaps with another SGLTT, uh, inhibitor will have similar results because then I think we can be sure that this is not a sort of a fluke. Um, having said that, um, what I'm basically I think missing is a similar type of emphasis on perhaps the hemodynamic problems in diabetes. For example in type 2 diabetes 80% are hypertensive most of these people have very stiff blood vessels. Arterial stiffening, I think, not only in the hypertension field, but also in the diabetes field, is a significant problem. Um, arterial stiffening is a strong risk factor, especially for stroke, but also for heart failure and for myocardial infarction, which are not only typically hypertensive complications, but also diabetic complications. And um, interestingly, if one goes to the European Society of Hypertension, you will have lots of sessions about these issues and very little on the metabolic side of diabetes. Here we see the reverse. I usually go to both meetings. But it's interesting that in clinical practice we are always looking at both things at the same time in 80% or 90% of people with type 2 diabetes. So, relatively speaking, this disconnect is something that I worry about a little. I would wish less disconnection on both sides of the equation and I would hope that things like arterial stiffening um, and blood pressure regulation were more of a topic at this um, kind of meeting as well because it is a very significant clinical problem. I think unfortunately that that will be very um, pharmacologically industry driven uh, because there are very few new antihypertensives reaching the market, the drive to do that kind of research is very difficult because funding is very difficult as compared to let's say metabolic funding which is at a, at a sort of high level simply because there are many companies 
uh, you know, entering this market with successful drugs. Um, and the other thing is that it has been extremely difficult to find drugs that, for example, affect arterial stiffening through affecting arterial structure rather than blood pressure. Um, because um, these drugs are not necessarily safe because if you, if you start tinkering with, let's say, with collagen in blood vessels, you may get um, aneurysms because that's the reverse of arterial stiffening, it's arterial weakening. So that's a, that is a very precise balance. Nevertheless, clearly, this is a very significant clinical problem and we need to tackle it. If we cannot tackle it, um, let's say, in terms of um, treatment, if it's there, then we should tackle it in terms of prevention. So what are the things that can actually prevent arterial stiffening? Be it, we are, we are now doing, we are starting an EFSD-sponsored trial where we are looking at um, at the question of whether reducing the amount of sitting time and replacing that by standing or walking uh, can actually improve arterial stiffening in people with type 2 diabetes. So it might be that that kind of new intervention um, in an early stage of that um, disease might be the way to go, rather than drugs. Yeah, well, I think that um, <clears throat> basically um, implementation, on the one hand, this disconnect between the metabolic and the hemodynamic worlds is something that needs to be bridged. Um, as I said, in the hemodynamic world, there are significant problems that are at almost at a standstill. There is no clear view of where that should go. On the other hand, uh, or next, uh, I think, um, a implementation of a healthy lifestyle in a preventive session or a pre uh, in a prevent preventive se setting or rather in a therapeutic setting is extremely difficult. I mean we are talking about it all the time but the amount of success um, in people who by and large are obese who have an unhealthy lifestyle is extremely difficult especially also because there are so many of them is not like it's a rare disease. Uh, so in terms of logistics, I think we are, and in terms of the organization of care, we are also facing um, significant problems. And finally, what we are facing, I think, with the, with the aging of the population is the problem of comorbidity, where people do not have diabetes and perhaps a myocardial infarction, but they will have four, five, six, seven, eight other diseases. So they will be like, you know, they will be 75 or older or perhaps 80 or older, and they will be taking 12 drugs and they will be seeing perhaps uh, four or five or six consultants uh, and their GP. And the whole um, organization and uh, goal setting in that context is something that we are, need to develop clearly and that we haven't developed to any significant extent as far as I can see. I think by and large I think awareness is more than it was like 20 or 30 years ago, clearly. Um, but I do think it needs to be improved even more. Um, let's say the, um, and the way people are um, given messages about healthy lifestyles is also something, is sometimes quite confusing. Let's say the diet wars uh, are perhaps a good example of how things should not be done. And um, this, this whole, um, let's say, academic debate on how low your blood pressure should actually be. And, you know, these uh, people, you know, at, at this conference can sort of have big debates about it. But the, 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 um, the sobering um, fact is that half of all people with diabetes are not even at the sort of highest level that people would recommend let alone at lower levels. So this is truly, for a large, to a large extent, an academic debate. Um, what is the use of debating whether we should go here if apparently for most people we cannot even get there? Um, so those, I think, um, the academic debate is necessary and I'm not saying it's, uh, uh, we shouldn't do it, but it clearly should be separate from how we try to get our message across to the general public. of this event. I would hope that the take-off message for this event is 
that um, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists are effective in terms of patients' outcomes and are also safe. I think the jury on those two issues is out. I'm going to these sessions also to learn more about safety. If the take-home matches of this particular meeting would be that we are relatively convinced that they are effective and safe, then I think that this will be, in the whole history of the ESD meeting, meetings, this will be a very special meeting, uh, perhaps at a similar level as the um, uh, meeting years ago, I think in Barcelona, when the uh, UKPDS uh, results were announced. Uh, that's an event that people remember, and I think if this event has a similar impact, then people will, will, will remember this event at a similar level.